the acute uh, acute uh, whether they are still smoking or not lah. But what I can tell you whether a, pers- a person is smoking, uh, not from what you actually see. Uh, but it's actually from uh, rather is from what um what do you smell? Uh, people who are still smoking they do have certain smells actually <laughs> when they talk to you. Uh, their breath actually contains all those uh, smokes actually. I mean, they uh, from the secret smokes. So you can actually can smell whether they are still actively smoking. <laughs> uh, you can't really see whether from the fingers physical sign to say they are actually uh, actively smokes or not. <laughs> But uh, of course, uh, sometimes uh, uh, collateral history would be better to elicit whether the patient is still smoking. Mm-hmm. Usually, uh, some of this history, especially the patient say I don't smoke anymore, but the children say, oh no, I saw you every uh, every day after meal, is, you truly, truly go and smoke. They say, ah, yeah, just one only. La. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what we usually tend to get. La. I see. All right. Uh, thanks, doctor. So uh, I, I think there'd be more questions about the chest examination. Uh, just a reminder to the people in the meeting, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to unmute anytime at all uh, uh, or type it in the chat. Uh, Ras will be reading out any questions in the chat. So based on the chest examination, um, the recessions would um, make a thing of the respiratory distress. But like Dr. Tan said, because the patient's not tachycardic, it is suspicious that maybe he isn't in respiratory distress. But the reduced chest expansion and the reduced breath sounds, Dr. Tan, these are classic uh, findings in COPD patients, uh, right? Even if it's not an exacerbation. Yeah, I think some of these patients they have because of the emphysematous lung, you tend to get reduced breath sound actually. Especially in the, uh, if you look at the uh, distribution of emphysema, it tend to be in the lower lobes actually. So that's why we oscillate it at the back towards the lower lobes. You tend sometimes you just hear nothing because <laughs> the uh, breath sound is just reduced uh, dramatically towards the lower lobes. Uh, one thing is that, um, just to let you all know, all those recessions, subcoastal recession, intercoastal recessions, we, we, we don't we don't quite see it in adults actually. It's mostly in, in children actually. Uh, in adults, if you see it, meaning this patient might be very very thin, <laughs> or we we'll say uh, cachexic or something, so then you can see these things. But otherwise, in a normal sized adult or even a patient with chronic bronchitis, usually uh, they are uh, more obese. Uh, more overweight, then you don't see this kind of uh, costal recession. I see. So, doctor, in that case, because for me, when I think of respiratory distress, I've been thought like, okay, it's either, it's tachypnea with recessions, and if the patient's oxygen, like from a short case setting, uh, definitely the patient is on uh, re- in respiratory distress. But then, if you're saying this about recessions, then how would you like really uh, for sure say, okay, this patient is in respiratory distress? Is there any other way besides combining yeah. these two? Things? Respiratory rate is one. Uh, mm-hmm. Number two, uh, whether uh, what we call it, uh, whether this patient have um, how labored is the breathing. With each breath, they are taking is actually more labored means more difficult to breathe. With uh, then you can see, and that is actually more uh, points towards the how difficult it, how, how severe is the uh, respiratory distress. Another thing is actually the requirement of oxygen. So if patient require any form of oxygen, whether it's nasal prong, ventri- ventri mask, or you know, high flow mask, then it, it, we still call this as a uh, uh, respiratory stress. I see. All right. Thanks, doctor. Uh, doctor, one more question. Uh, typically, what uh, I've heard is like when you say wheeze and the wrong kai, wheeze is what you hear externally, and the wrong kai is what you hear in auscultation. Is that really true, or is that like uh, not so? Mm, uh, I, I would say that sometimes you can use interchangeably. Lah. Mm. You can try inter, inter, interchangeably lah. So, uh, but I I don't think the examiner will will fault you if let's say you mention it's a V or wrong kai. Yeah. I see. All right. Mm. Um. Okay. So, uh, regarding the rest of the physical examination for this patient, uh, apex bit was not displaced to indicate maybe a cardiomegaly or a mediastinal shift, but uh, not typically in a case of COPD, maybe more in a pneumothorax. Uh, there's no palpable P2 indicating pulmonary hypertension, possibly due to core pulmonale, secondary red heart failure, and vocal resonance was normal in both sides. Other examinations done, there was no cervical lymphadenopathy, there was no sacral or pedal edema if you're thinking heart failure. And uh, maybe you can ask the audience uh, about this. The liver edge is palpable two centimeters below the costal margin, but the liver span when measured was uh, ATM. So uh, anyone in the audience want to perhaps explain why this is so? 
Because typically we know that if you palpate a liver below a coastal margin, uh, most likely it's hepatomegaly, but we know that for a liver span, 8 to 12 or maybe smaller in the Asian population is uh, the normal size. So this patient, uh, what, what would you comment on it? Anyone in the audience would like to share? I think it's because of the hyper expansion of the chest itself due to COPD. Mm -hmm. Resulting in? It, uh, pushing the liver downward. Yeah, so I'd probably say the same thing. This is probably ptosis of the liver. Uh, yeah. Is this, uh, Dr. Tan, is this like common to see like ptosis in most patients with COPD? Mm, I would say. Uh, most of the time, it's incidental findings, lah. So most of the time, you still don't you don't get to palpable. You don't feel the liver age at all, lah. Just like normal. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in fact, uh, I would say um a lot of COPD patients sometimes you 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 might actually uh uh one of the classical features is actually you don't able you are not able to um feel for the effect of it because of hyperinflated lung. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, sometimes. Because their yeah, lung is so hyperinflated, when you percuss the uh, try to percuss to find the upper edge of the liver, you can't find it because it's it's, it's just all resonance all over. <laughs> so the estimation might be sometimes maybe uh not very correct actually. Let's see, doctor, the resonant we would still just uh, comment it as resonant only, right? Not hyper resonant as that would lead uh, the person to believe it's like a uh, pneumothorax, right? Um. Okay, resonance is something very subjective. Mm. So you can say it's resonant, it doesn't matter. Uh, but when we mention hyper resonance, means that there's increase in resonance. Uh, most of the time, we will relate it to pneumothorax. Uh, okay. um, Mirza, maybe can you go back to one slide? Uh, yeah, the effects bits here, not displaced. Uh, I think it's actually an important findings to tell you whether um, this patient has pneumothorax, one thing. I think uh, um, also if let's if the, let's say the trachea is debated, they also will tell you whether this patient has some form of lung collapse or whether it's fibrosis and things like that. So the location of the apex bit is important as well because I think uh, very often some students tend to forget about to examine the apex bits uh, mm -hmm. during the whether it's short case or long case. So sometimes uh, this is something that um, essential that if let's say if you uh, finish examination instead of time, this try to try to actually examine for this. All right, thanks, doctor. Um, so typically, at the end of short cases or long cases, we'll always the doctor would usually ask like, "How would you complete your examination?" And I know most students, including myself, we have like a script that we like to say depending on the examination. So in this case, I guess uh, one would say, oh, "I'd like to check the rest of the vital signs of the patient: temperature, chart, uh, blood pressure." And in a respiratory examination, we'd want to comment on the sputum cup uh, and also uh, do a, a peak flow. But uh, doctor, is there anything else in a uh, respiratory examination, or in this case specifically, that we'd want to do? Mm, I think this is, I mean, quite fairly standard script. Lah. I think uh, looking at the sputum mark, uh, looking at the peak flow, um, yeah, the white, the um, fever, whether looking for any fever, uh, things like that. I mean, those are quite standard uh, uh, script we tend to mention lah, for, especially in short case. Lah. Because a uh, short case, you can't, uh, you can't do everything. So at the end, you said, I would like to complete my examination by checking the, all these, these things. Uh, just to show the examiner that actually you are actually a complete, uh, you actually are thinking you are actually trying to be complete, like complete students. Lah. So, uh, examine everything that is relevant. I see. Dr. Ben, in that case, um, one question I had in mind, like usually students will base it off a script, but uh, I was thinking like in a pneumothorax, would you still mention peak flow in this case? Yeah, it wouldn't the, if you're doing a peak flow in like a pneumothorax patient, wouldn't it have the risk of increasing the... Yeah, uh, of, of, um, okay, so there are two things here. Um, usually we, for your exam, we won't give you uh, uh, acute medical problems. Mm. So usually patients with pneumothorax are almost, almost never come out in exam. Right? <laughs> so, so uh, but uh, of course you're right. So in the patient with uh, pneumothorax, we don't do a peak flow. And uh, of course, they don't come with a uh, productive sputum. They don't have sputum mark. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So that's the thing, lah. So uh, of course, in a standard exam for for exam for your long case or short case or whether it's modified long case, uh, we tend to give you common exam case, lah. So things like asthma, COPD, uh, even uh, bronchiectasis, 
uh, lung fibrosis. Those are common exam cases that tend to come up for, for, for you, that we tend to give you. Uh, uh, we don't, we hope, we usually don't give you pneumonia because those are acute medical problems. We don't give you uh, pneumothorax. Uh, even acute exacerbation of asthma or COPD also we won't give you because uh, these are patients that sometimes they uh, can be difficult to manage in the exam work. Uh, you don't want to talk to a patient that have an uh, exacerbation that can't really speak so much to you. <laughs> so uh, we tend to give you a stable case. Uh, so the only stable patient that we tend likely to give you are usually bronchiectasis, uh, lung fibrosis. Uh, I think we also, I, I think we put out an OSA patient before also. Mm. So OSA doctor, like things other you want to complete your examination would be like neck circumference, BMI. Yeah, I mean, those are, you'll find out the, the what are the risk factors that this patient to develop OSA. Mm, I see. All right, so um, the next part will be talking about the provisional diagnosis and maybe a rate of differential, which we've mentioned uh, in our discussion with uh, Dr. Tan. Right now, of course, we're thinking about an acute exacerbation of CPD. A few other things Dr. Tan has mentioned, it could be uh, COVID now with uh, like, basically we're in the pandemic. So of course, uh, shortness of breath, but this patient doesn't have fever, no URTI symptoms also, but we want to evaluate, maybe he'd be in a category three, which uh, of course would progress further. Other differentials that we also would have would be uh, pneumothorax, a COPD is a risk factor for de developing pneumothorax. However, based on the, uh, there's no chest pain in this patient and based on the physical examination, it's unlikely there's a pneumothorax, there's no hyper resonance and uh, it's definitely not tension pneumothorax as there's no mediastinal shift. Pleural effusion uh, could be a possibility, but uh, pleural effusion would have an underlying cause. And in this patient, uh, there's no uh, congestive heart failure, chronic kidney disease, and there's nothing else to indicate a unilateral pleural effusion in the physical examination findings. Either there's no stony dullness on percussion. Pulmonary embolism was another thing, uh, but Dr. Tan said we should probably ask a bit more on the history based on his sedentary lifestyle and uh, whether he had any leg swelling or any uh, prolonged immobilization. And decompensate, decompensated right heart failure is another uh, possible diagnosis in this patient, but we know there's no, uh, he doesn't really have any fluid overload symptoms such as leg swelling or uh, ascites or any palpable P2, and there's no cardiomegaly. But a uh, doctor would, uh, if let's say the patient had a decompensated right heart failure, we know a COD, COPD patient would be uh, having hyperinflation. So, like you said, the uh, percussion would be duller. So, would it be like, something that might make it hard to detect a cardiomegaly in a patient with COPD? Okay, so this is back to the question on how do you conduct examinations for a patient with uh, uh, impalpable apex speed. Mm. Okay, so there's only a few uh, differentials if you have impalpable apex speed. One is actually a hyperinflated lungs. One is actually your dextrocardia. Okay, uh, the other one is obesity. Or in the female with a huge breast. So uh, if you can't fail the apex beat, what you what uh, what the student should do is actually uh, turn the patient towards the lateral. So you actually move the heart more nearer to the chest wall. So technically, by doing this, you'll be able to feel. Uh, we'll be able to uh, pop it for the apex beat. So even in the COPD patient. I see. All right. Uh, so. Yeah. Um, uh, doctor, do you want to move to investigations or? Uh, I think uh, we talked a lot. Yeah, we, yeah, I think we discussed a lot of this already. Uh, all right. So uh, investigation uh, for a patient like this. So uh, does anyone in the, uh, the I know, uh, anyone in the chat want to perhaps outline what the investigation is? This is typically a common question in if you get like a long case or short case, the doctor would ask you, how would you like to investigate this patient? So maybe you want to give it a try? Okay, uh, from the chat, uh, there is no, um, that no one, no one there. Okay, so now maybe we can start with full blood count first. Yeah, full blood count. And, okay, full, full blood count is because we want to look for any uh, well blood cell, raised in well blood cell also, and also anemi uh, anemia, can lead to SOB also. And, and we proceed with the renal function test because a renal cause also can lead to SOB if there is pleural effusion. Yeah. Also liver function test. Yeah, you, you're sure now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> or maybe oh. Russ, you can give a 
short why why we do this test. So I, I like how Russ uh, went to explain what her investigations uh, would like to do. But of course, in an, an exam setting, by the time you get to investigation, it's quite like a very fretful situation, especially for someone like me. So I like to keep my mind still in order, and I like to mention what I like to do at the bedside, what I like to do, at, uh, what a lab test I like to do, what I'd like to do for imaging, so that I don't miss anything. So maybe this is a tip that maybe you can uh, bring forward to. So yeah, I started with a lab investigations. Uh, so these are some investigations uh, we'd like to do in this patient. So like I said, a full blood count and differential count. Uh, it could be an infection, COVID to rule out, and also an infective exacerbation of COPD. Another thing in patients with COPD, they'd have uh, in chronic compensation, like uh, Dr. Tan said, uh, besides having uh, a higher respiratory rate, they could also have polycythemia, which would be evident in the full blood count. And we'll have a look at that later to see if this patient has it. Uh, ESR, CRP, and ferritin levels. Uh, ESR and CRP for inflammatory markers, I think the CRP would be more for infection. Uh, ferritin levels is also an acute inflammatory uh, protein. Of course, in a patient with respiratory distress, uh, you'd want to do an ABG uh, to see if there's any metabolic uh, acid base disorder or any respiratory distress, uh, respiratory failure in this patient. A SARS-CoV, uh, RTK, RT-PCR, RTK antigen uh, to detect uh, COVID. Sputum and blood culture and sensitivity, sputum for acid fast bacilli for your tuberculosis, our renal profile, uh, cardiac enzymes. The patient did present with chest tightness. So uh, maybe you'd want to, uh, cardiac enzymes, I personally probably wouldn't uh, say cardiac enzymes as I'd rather do uh, ECG to see for any ST changes, a bit depression or elevation, because I think cardiac enzymes will take a long time, but uh, Dr. Tan, maybe uh, you can correct me on that. D-dimer to uh, as a simple tool to rule out uh, your pulmonary embolism as it has a high sensitivity. So that means basically if a D-dimer is negative, then you probably don't have to think about pulmonary embolism. But if the D-dimer is positive, uh, doesn't mean that the patient has pulmonary embolism. And then in that case, you don't want to proceed towards a CT uh, pulmonary angiography. And BNP would be raised in cases of heart failure. Uh, imaging, uh, you'd want to do a chest x-ray, which we'll have a look at later, and maybe someone can interpret it. Uh, high resolution CT, which Dr. Tan has explained earlier, where you'd see uh, in an in, in ephysometer's lung, you'd see a lot of black, as there's a lot of air trapping in patients with uh, uh, COPD. And the CTPA would uh, be, I guess, in the case of uh, pulmonary embolism. And other tests you want to do is uh, lung function tests, uh, ECG, and echocardiogram. Um, maybe this patient has uh, heart failure, so you don't want to look at the ejection fraction. Uh, Dr. Tan, uh, did I say anything wrong or perhaps anything that uh, I missed in terms of the explanation? Yeah, um, actually, the the reason I put ESR, CRP, and ferritin because uh, those are the few tests we tend to do in a COVID patient. Oh. So, so a patient coming in with a COVID pneumonia, uh, particularly patient kind of short of breath, uh, hypoxia, and x-ray shows some consolidations, then we wanted to know whether uh, at what stage that this patient is, patient whether is still in the vi viremic stage or whether they are already uh, going into the immune uh, immunology stage. So because uh, when they are in the uh, viremic stage, uh, we will see the ESR and CRP tend to be uh, increased, or uh, everything is increased, but the, when the repeated tests, they tend to be in static. Whereas when they go into the immunology phase, meaning they are already going to the cytokine storms stage, uh, whereas where the uh, virus trigger a lot of cytokine release, then this is what when we call the cytokine release syndrome stage, uh, we tend to see a jump in the ESR, uh, jump in CRP and as ferritin. So the, the ESR and ferritin level can double. And from the poor counts, uh, of course you can see polycythemia, uh, uh, I mean in, in certain case of COPD, uh, we don't usually see anemia. La. So a lot of these uh, COPD patients, they don't get anemic. <laughs> anyway, uh, and uh, the differential counts is important to tell you whether what kind of infection the patient is going on, whether it's bacteria or it's virus. Um, if, in relation to COVID-19, we look at the lymphocyte counts. So um, in the initial viremic phase, we tend to see uh, low absolute lymphocyte counts. They drop in the lymphocyte counts. Uh, so that will actually will tell us um, these patients uh, with, let's say, low, low lymphocyte, high ES, high CRP, high ferritin, and it's a couple of the symptoms. This and a patient might have some maybe uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2. Then we might want to do an RT-PCR or 
RTK antigen. RTK antigen is actually a rapid test, bedside test. They tell you can get the results very fairly rapid. Uh, as a there's a name in Pi, we detecting the antigen in the very big phase. Uh, of course, the gold standard for diagnosis is still RT-PCR, which is a swab test. But that will take about 24 hours to get the results. Okay, so in the patients that are very highly suspicious of uh, SARS-CoV, then uh, of course we will do a, a antigen test, which is a bedside test. Uh, before uh, we, so we, we, do, we wait for the confirmation test. Um, yeah, so the investigation of actually basically is based on your differentials. Uh. So whatever differentials you have, then you then you think of uh, what investigation you should do for each of the uh, differential diagnoses. Okay. So you think of heart disease, of course, you think of cardiac enzymes, ECG, uh, BNP. You think of uh, infections like TB, of CNS, sputum. Uh, okay. If you think of uh, effusion, of course, you can look at renal profiles uh, and, and, uh, and and the whether it's any other slide in the x-rays uh others investigation here that you mentioned like lung functions um you don't do it in doing acute setting like you tend to do it later but of course this might be one of the answers you can give in the exam uh for lung function there are many types of lung function the one that commonly most of all know is actually the spirometry uh, which is uh, easier than you get the fpv1 fpc and fpc ratio fpv1 over fpc ratio uh, the more advanced lung function is what we call those with lung volumes. Now we look at, at the uh, what is the total lung capacity, what is the vital capacity, what is the residual volume. Of course, uh, we also do in uh, maybe after postgraduate, we for master student we tend to ask them to interpret about DLCO and KCO. These are gas transfer. More means how effective the gas transfer is. And uh, if if you like uh, respiratory medicines. And uh, they are more advanced uh, lung function that we do, something called IOS, in, it's called impulse oscillometry. It's something that we actually um, use to quantify the resistance of the airway. So how, how, res how, how much resistance is there in your airway? So uh, what do these tests tell us? Whether this patient having a small airway disease, okay? So um, if you look at the latest pathophysiology of uh, COPD, beside your emphysema, bronchitis, there's actually another one that what we call uh, as small airway disease. Okay, so small airway disease means the peripheral airways are very tight, very small. So the uh, how to do how to know about this? You can do a uh, impulse oscillometry, IOS in short. Um, ECG basically is for your uh, whether to see any right heart stream patterns. If let's say if you're having a pulmonary embolism. Or even if you were thinking of uh, heart failures, you might not want to look for the uh, any ST ST changes or T T changes T inversion or such. Uh, echo of course is more related to your heart failures now. I see. All right. Uh, so uh, here we have the differential count of the patient. I think we're uh, wrapping up the first case. So uh, in this patient, uh, I'll just quickly interpret. So the hemoglobin levels are normal in this range. Uh, hematocrit is also normal. This uh, white blood cell is not elevated, so uh, we can rule out infection from here. And the platelets are also normal. Based on the differential count, we see uh, the ranges. Oh, sorry, I think uh, there's a typo here. Uh, but basically, uh, for this patient, the differential count was normal, uh, basically, in this case. Uh, but doctor, actually, I have a question. Uh, Based on the percentage, we know that uh, typically patients would have higher neutrophils and uh, lower lymphocytes, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So, like, if you get a, if we get a case where there's higher lymphocytes than neutrophils in a case with no leukocytosis, does that like make you think of anything, or do we disregard that in the differential count? Okay, so if in the no leukocytosis, but you get low lymphocytes, so sometimes you need to think of COVID. <laughs> Mm. So that, that, that tend to happen in the vir viral pneumonia. La. So in the, in the case of uh, viral infections, you tend to get uh, normal or low uh, leuco leuco leukocyte. And uh, when you look at the differential counts, the lymphocyte can be, can be lower, reduced. La. I see. Okay. So uh, the ABG for this patient is also mostly unremarkable. His uh, pH level is uh, slightly uh, 
I guess this would be acidic uh, if we take 7.4, but it's still in the normal ranges. Its carbon dioxide is not elevated and the oxygen is actually 217. Uh, does anyone want to perhaps suggest why uh, the, the uh, PO2 is higher than normal values? You can put it in the chat or you can just uh, say it out. Uh, show in are you here maybe you can like tell us or if you get a uh, abg like this and you see everything's normal except the oxygen is high why why would the oxygen be high in this case hi uh good evening dr and Riza. actually there's a uh, reply in the chat from lee oh. jiyong he say hyperventil hyperventilation yep hyperventilation uh, doctor maybe you can comment on that okay so i think when we look at abg First thing we want to know whether this ABG is taken under room air or is it taken under some oxygen supplement <laughs> or on uh, while the patient is using some, some form of device or uh, it's taken during the nebulizer. <laughs> okay. That's, uh, why is it important? Because if let's say this is taken under room air, uh, you 217 of uh, PaO2 is definitely is, is, is uh, supraphysiological. <laughs> So meaning uh, if you are hyperventilating, uh, you would expect your PaCO2 should be dropped because the, when you breathe in and breathe out more, you tend to remove your carbon dioxide. <laughs> okay, so it shouldn't be a hyperventilating. And uh, looking at these results, I my guess lah, my guess is actually um, this might this ABG might be taken during the uh, nebulizer. Uh, or uh, patient is on some form of oxygen supplement. Okay, if let's say this patient is on some form of oxygen supplements, uh, if I see this ABG, I will quickly re, uh, cut down the oxygen supply for this patient. We reduce it. Uh, why is it so? Uh, because in patients, if you uh, uh, should I answer, or maybe we can get someone else. Or maybe I'll just answer lah, because we're running a bit out of time. So I guess in patients in COPD, we have this thing called hypoxic drive. Uh, so if the, P the PO2 is very high, there's a high risk for the patient to uh, have respiratory failure because um, in patients in COPD, due to the chronic retention of CO2, they're dependent on the oxygen to drive their respiratory rate. So if the oxygen is now uh, hypox high per oxic rather than hypoxemic, they've lost this drive and it could uh, proceed into respiratory failure. Uh, am I right, doctor? Mm, uh, not really, uh, Miza. Uh, <laughs> because I think in COPD, as you mentioned, uh, as, as all of you know, that CO they tend to retain carbon dioxide. So uh, all this carbon dioxide is actually is the thing that drives the patient to breathe. So by giving them too much CO2, you actually wash out the carbon dioxide. So when someone is dependent on carbon dioxide to stimulate the breathing and you wash out the, 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 the thing that can stimulate to breathe, they can actually go into respiratory failure. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, in COPD patients, we tend not to give them too much oxygen because one, the, um, the lung is bad enough. They couldn't, the, all the emphysematous lung, they couldn't absorb the oxygen. So by giving so much oxygen, it's, the, it's no use for them. Number two, uh, if you give too much oxygen, you remove the carbon, the CO2 retentions, the you wash out the CO2, patient might be uh, when the respiratory failures really. <laughs> so it's not good for the patient. So in the CO, in COPD patients, particularly, we usually we, do, we try not to give too much oxygen. I see. So doctor, it's actually depending on the CO2, not the oxygen. Like when we say things like hypoxic drive, it's still. Yeah, hypoxic drive means the. Yeah, I mean. If you are if you are retaining carbon dioxide, of course your oxygen will be much will be lower lah. <laughs> but it's the one that the is the your the one that in the in the the one that can stimulate the breathing is your CO two is your uh, what do you call the receptor again? Uh, the the chemo chemo receptor I think. Yeah. 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 That the uh, that the your blood detect the CO two when it's more acidic then it's uh, stimulate more the, the the breathing actually. All right. So um, that's the ABG, and uh, I think this is the last investigation picture that I have. So this is a chest X-ray picture. Um, uh, Lim Chia Sia, 
do you want to try to maybe tell us what you see on this chest X-ray? Okay, hi, hi, Dr. Um, I see there's hyperlucency on the left entire loop, loop. Um, and there's also hyperlucency in the right upper loop. Um, I think otherwise the heart is slightly deviated, um, displaced to the middle. Um, I can't really appreciate the right border of the heart as well. And um, maybe the the diaphragm is pretty normal. Uh, I think that's it. I think, yeah, I think that's it for me. All right. Thanks, Jia Siang, for participating. Uh, doctor, maybe you can give your comments. Uh, I think I think most people uh, observe the obvious things that you see on these X-rays. I think there are comment in the chat. This is hyperinflated. Yes, the answer is correct. Uh, whatever you mentioned is correct. I think uh, for students, I think always try to uh, if you uh, ask in the exam how to uh, interpret a chest X-ray, always start from the basics first. So this is a chest X-ray of so and so taken at what view? Uh, is it uh, adequately exposed? Uh, what is it rotated or not? Uh, yeah, so if you're looking at rotations, you look at, at the uh, the uh, the end of the uh, clavicles to in in relation to the spinous process. Uh, if you ask me, I think it's slightly a bit ro rotated lah. <laughs> if you look at it, because <laughs> the the right side seems to be further a bit further than the left actually in re in relation to the spinous process. Okay. Uh, and uh, then uh, once you gone through this. Or these few things, then only uh, drill into the uh, what you see. You either can see start from the center going out or from outside going in. You have, if you go outside from in, you start from the lung first. So, uh, so you of course you see a lot of lucency shadows here. So, uh, but of course, um, what do we call this? Do you know any medical terms that we call this? The lucency yeah. of the lung. Yeah. It's, I think if I'm not missing it's called pulmonary oligemia. <laughs> so uh, basically it's described the uh, the oli the lucency that you saw. Uh, huh? So you tend to see it's very classical description in patient with COPD. Uh, on the comment on the right heart borders, um, yes, you don't really see it. But uh, the reason is actually um, the... Uh, you can see the both side of the lung is actually hyperinflated. So the di the diaphragm lost the dome shape actually. So it's actually a flat almost a flattened diaphragm. Okay. So uh, and uh, when in the patient they have the inflated lungs, um, your heart tend to like being squeezed in the middle. <laughs> so you can see the heart seems like very elongated in the center. Okay. So that's why you don't see much of the right heart border. <laughs> okay. Um, another thing, maybe you, you can comment if you, in this case, it's not that obvious uh, whether there's any, um, prove the, what about the pulmonary, uh, the pulmonary vasculature, the pulmonary trunks, is it enlarged? Because sometimes in some of these COPD patients, they can have pulmonary hypertensions. You can see some prominent pulmonary trunks, uh, both in both hilas, uh, but in this case, I don't think so. Lah, no? Yep. And, uh, so another thing, if let's say, uh, if you see all this lucency, uh, you want to know whether this is pneumothorax or is it COPD or is it some maze, maybe some beauty. So then you need to see see any uh, lung markings or not. Okay, in uh, patient COPD, you may be able to see some lung markings. Uh, in beauty wise, uh, you might just see uh, maybe uh, rounded borders or sometimes uh, very, very thin uh, line. Uh, pneumothorax, why, of course, you can see the lung being collapsed. Lah. But uh, in this case, maybe is more towards the COPD one part. I see. Uh, doctor, I have a question. Usually when we have hyperinflated lung, uh, besides the flat diaphragm, we're also told to count the anterior posterior ribs more than 6 mm -hmm. or 10. I always have trouble like counting from the top. I like because there's uh, a lot of structures here, so I don't exactly know like which one is one or like in this case, like yeah, any it, it, it's, 
Okay, so I because I see uh if you can either come come from the front or come from the back lah. So the front is like in this case the lung is so hyperinflated it might not be able to see the ribs anterior ribs uh clearly. So you and then the posterior you can count the posterior ribs lah. So here I think one two three four five six seven eight nine yeah almost ten lah. Okay, so uh. So is the counting ribs is only like you can either count from use the front one, front ribs or the backs. Thanks. So uh, that's all you're getting the investigations. And now the last part, uh, we'll talk about the management. So the management uh, in this case would be divided into acute and chronic uh, long term management. So the acute management, of course, in a patient with an acute exacerbation, you want to assess the patient uh, with ABCD, checking if there's airway, breathing, circulation, and you want to stabilize the patient at the accident and emergency. And as we've uh, mentioned earlier, you want to start, if the patient needs oxygen therapy, uh, you want to start him on controlled oxygen therapy to prevent uh, them going into respiratory failure due to the uh, dependence on carbon dioxide. And uh, bronchodilators and systemic corticosteroids, which we also did discuss in a bit, and uh, for the long-term management, you could consider stepping up the current therapy. I'm uh, not sure how the principle is compared to asthma, uh, whereas asthma, there's very clear steps, but for uh, COPD, I'm not too sure. But yeah, uh, another thing we talked about offering vaccinations for this patient, uh, pneumococcal influenza COVID-19 and uh, COPD education, because Dr. Tan also did mention that maybe the patient was using the wrong inhaler or maybe the technique is also wrong. So maybe at the end of my examination, I also like to, uh, to assess the patient's inhaler technique. Uh, then advice on physical activity, pulmonary rehab and a COPD action plan, which I think is all in the current uh, gold guidelines. Uh, doctor, any comments on the management? Oh yeah, before we go on management, I think just now the, there's a comment in the chat. They said uh, reduce cardiothoracic ratio uh, for the x-rays, but um, I, there's only such thing as increased uh, CT ratio, cardiothoracic ratio. There's no such thing as reduced cardio, cardiothoracic ratio. La. So uh, that doesn't tell you much about uh, the um, heart. La. So we don't use uh, reduced uh, CT ratio. La. Okay, so in terms of management wise, I think uh, these are pretty standard managements. I think uh, control oxygen therapy. We try not to give too much oxygen. Uh, most of the time, patient coming exacerbation, oxygen is always a must, but uh, we try to control it. Uh, number uh, then bronchodilators. Um, the way to give it most of the time is actually using a nebulizer, uh, nebulized bronchodilator. Uh, of course, in a patient with uh, like mild exacerbation at home, they use their own inhalers, your Sama and Saba. Um, at home, but in hospitals, uh, before the pandemic, we tend to give uh, nebulizers. I think during the pandemics, we try to reduce the use of nebulizer because all this can, uh, if let's say patient, the patient have COVID-19 uh, infection, you can actually disseminate the, uh, the, the viruses through the nebulizer. <laughs> so, so it will be a, a hazard to the healthcare workers. So nowadays, uh, what, we, what do we do? We use the airway chamber. We put 10 puff of the uh, the Saba or Sama inside there, ask patient to breathe through the aerosol chamber. So that will reduce the uh, aerosol generating procedures. So then uh, less risk of uh, disseminating the virus. Uh, of course, in the patient with um, acute exacerbations, always give systemic corticosteroids. So you can either give an uh, IV or even an oral, tab uh, oral tablets as well. So it depends on how severe is it. If patients uh, like, uh, very bad, they require admission most of the time, very, very sick, they tend to give a IV parenteral uh, corticosteroids. Uh, if patients have mild anticipation, just some nebulizer, you think that you, you may benefit for some oral corticosteroid like prednisolone, you can use tablets. So I think long-term management wise, uh, I think this is, uh, okay, stepping up treatments. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's not so simple like asthma. So I think this patient on uh, triple therapy, triple inhaler therapy, that is already the max uh, inhalation therapy the patient will receive. La. Okay, so uh, the next steps for COPD management, if let's say patient already on triple therapy is actually uh, thinking of uh, what to do next. So the next is actually either you can give them some microlytes or some uh, oral therapy like uh, Ropromilas. Okay. So these are there are special criteria to use this. These are some other uh, options to use after your inhaler therapy. Uh, of course, we're also thinking of uh, non-pharmacological therapy. 
uh, things like uh, what we can do. Um, you know, there's a lot of air trapping uh, hyperinflation. Uh, there's actually a way to reduce the hyperinflation. So previously, people tend to do surgery. They remove the diseased lung and um, so, so that the remaining uh, healthy lung can expand and fill the space. But surgery is always very risky and very uh, dangerous for COPD patients. Okay, so nowadays, what we can do, we can do a bronchoscope and we can put a endobronchial valve. Meaning uh, we put a valve into the disease airway. So we'll allow the air to come out from the from the disease lobe, but not allowing air to go into the disease lobe. Then you read, then you sort of like uh, manually collapse the disease lung, disease lobe. So the remain, remaining other parts of the lung will expand. So that is uh, how we uh, what we call lung reduction uh, uh, procedure. Okay. So of course, yeah, surgical lung uh, reduction surgery, like your like what I said, the lobectomy or remove disease part of the lung. Or nowadays, a uh, non-invasive way is actually doing a bronchoscope and putting in a valve. Uh, the rest are quite standard. Vaccination, of course. Uh, COPD ex uh, educations, usually the inhaler part is very important because there are so many inhalers uh, nowadays. Uh, I think you guys need to really familiar with it because a uh, patient can come, come and ask, tell you, or uh, well, so, uh, show you inhalers and you don't know what is it, then it's very difficult. <laughs> okay. So previously, you only have very limited like PMDIs, uh, metal dose inhalers, that's like your sabutamol. But nowadays, we got more and more inhalers. So uh, we have breeze healer, we have recipe mat, we have elector, we have next healer, you name it, there's so many of it. <laughs> okay, primary rehab is actually an is essential part of the uh, management. Okay, I think all patients with COPD should refer to primary rehab because in primary rehab, they besides optimize the nutrition, they also uh, teach the patient how to breathe effectively, how to mobilize uh, effectively by using the least energy and least breath. Okay, so with their limited breath, they can what they can do actually. And uh, nowadays there's something called besides like you know about asthma action plan, we also have COPD action plan nowadays. So to teach educate patients what they should do when they have mild exacerbation, what they should do when they have moderate exacerbation, what they should do when they have severe exacerbation. More towards is uh, patients' uh, personalized care, personalized management. All right, so I think that ends the first case. Uh, do we have any questions from the uh, participants before I move on? Uh, Rex, are there any questions in the chat? Um, hi, Dr. No. Shirin. I have one question. Uh, right. when, would we, when would we actually recommend patients to have a nebulizer at home? Yeah, good question. So I think uh, um, nebulizer is actually, I usually discourage patients to have a nebulizer at home, whether they are asthma or COPD. Uh, for just one simple reason. Um, we use nebulizer in hospital during acute access patients. And um, what do you think will happen if, let's say, patients have nebulizer at home? Okay, and they come to, they come to you in the emergency uh, this after failing nebulize, nebulizer at home. What do you think we can do for the patients? Nothing, right? So, uh, nebulizers should only be used during emergency setting, means in hospital setting. Uh, they should not be using their nebuli uh, nebulizer at home. They should use their inhalers. Uh, by use having a nebulizer at home, it will just delay the uh, presentation to the hospital, meaning patient will come to you at at a very serious state, a uh, very severe state that uh, because they come to the hospital, I cannot give them nebulizer anymore because they already had it at home and it's not working. I can give them some uh, corticosteroid, but that may not work immediately because uh, the problem is in the lung. You need some bronchodilatation, but you already use it at home. So what is the next step? Is Only what we can do is intubate the patient and mechanically ventilate it. So meaning is, uh, and uh, we usually try not to in, uh, make, uh, intubate and ventilate a COPD patient because um, COPD patients, you know, their lung is disease. They are actually very having very poor lung functions. Um, when it comes to anticipation, meaning the lung is actually overstretched really. You just like uh, imagine the car just now, you stretch them 
ask them to run 100 meters uh, or run a, run a, a rally or something, something like that, they can't really uh, move already. And now you come to a, come to you at a very dire state, you want to die already, then you put them on a life support uh, mach uh, ventilator machines. Uh, just like uh, hook the uh, hook, uh, the car just now, the old car just now, you, you put an additional turbo engine there. So the, the old engine will not be functioned, so it will be dependent on the external engine to work. So the same goes to the lung. So the lung, if you have very disease, you put them on the ventilator, they take over the function of the lung, and after that, you realize that you, the lung, the body seems like dependent on the ventilator to breathe. They cannot breathe on their own anymore. Well, the disease lung is so bad, they just refuse to function anymore. So that's why we try not to in, uh, intubate a patient, uh, COPD patient, because you don't want this to happen. <laughs> okay? So in order to prevent that, make sure they use their inhaler at home and uh, not to have an nebulizer at home. Okay, not a doctor, thank you. No problem. Uh, doctor, I have a question actually. We know we uh, try to reduce exacerbations as one of the treatment targets for COPD patient. So in this case, if the uh, COPD exacerbation is due to the house construction, do we like give advice on patient like, or in the future, uh, try to wear masks when you have renovation around or something like that? Or like, uh, is there really like nothing we can do? Uh, I think personal, I mean, if you are, if the hazard is coming from a workplace, of course the personal protective equipment is important, your PPE is important, like a mask or, uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, COPD wise, um, environmental costs can be an issue, but um, sometimes it's uncontrollable. <laughs> Mm. So things like if you live near a factory, you can tell, cannot just tell, oh, okay, never mind, you move to another place that <laughs> all the factory. <laughs> then, uh, but things like the patient can do, maybe get some air purifier, uh, so at least uh, some, some air filter or something like that, so that uh, they have less exposure to that and they get more cleaner air. That sometimes may help. I see. Thanks, Doctor. Uh, Doctor, I think there's a question in the chat regarding the uh, use of ICS between asthma and COPD. Uh, I don't think, I think H.H. H. Tan wasn't too clear about like uh, why the reason. Uh, okay, so I, I, I think it's, um, okay, so you know that in asthma, they said a lot of uh, inflammations. Okay. So, uh, and uh, when you give ICS in a patient with a lot of inflammation, so the anti-inflammatory process actually take, take, take part and uh, reduces all the inflammation. So you, you don't get the, uh, the, the risk of pneumonia might be still there, but it's actually less. So the reason that in COPD there is more uh, is simply because um, there's not much inflammation is one. Number two, there's, there's also a lot of mucus production. Yeah, you know your chronic bronchitis, your emphysema, sometimes they can get a lot of sputum actually. So they get all this sputum, and uh, sputum can be, uh, all this mucus uh, is actually very good media for bacterial growth actually. Okay, so if you had uh, less inflammations, uh, but you use a lot, a lot of ICS, uh, after you reduce anti-inflammatory effects uh, resolve, um, the remaining, the extra ICS that's inside the airways, will actually trap inside the your mucus and uh, become a very good media for the bacterial growth. <laughs> so that's why uh, in COPD, they tend to get increased risk of uh, infect lung infection compared to asthma. In asthma, there's, the inflammation is there, but not so much of the mucus production. You, you, you can see our asthma patients most of the time, they have some cough, but it's not that chesty actually. It's more like, a, um, the more symptoms is short of breath, wheezing, uh, more of like bronchus constriction type of uh, symptoms actually. And uh, the predominant pathophysiology is still the inflammation. So when you give adequate anti-inflammations, the, anti the inflammation subsided, of course, uh, you don't get much of the uh, residuals being remain there. All right, thanks doctor. I hope uh, we've answered your question, H.H. Shan. Yeah, uh, thank you doctor. So um, if there are no other questions, I think we can move on to the second case with Ras, which I'm also looking forward to because I think the case is a bit more interesting. <laughs> so Ras. Okay, uh, thank you, Mirza. So we proceed with the second case. Nice. OK, 
became Madam M, a 55 years old Malay woman with underlying lung cancer, presented to hospital with SOB, cough and chest pain. So uh, since Mirza already asked about cough and SOB just now, can someone uh, try to tell me what I'm going to ask about chest pain? Anyone? Narissa? Okay, uh, how about Mirza? Can you try for chest pain? So I think chest pain is one of the first few complaints every medical student gets. And then the first thing they always learn is to go by Socrates. So like ask from side yeah. onset the radiation, all this. But uh, I mean, pertinent to like a respiratory case, okay, like if we're really thinking respiratory, but of course you should be thinking about uh, systems also. I guess uh, if I want to think about like pulmonary embolism, those sort of things, and I'd ask about leg swelling, or if I want to know about uh, a pneumothorax and like what Dr. Tan said, like uh, any history of uh, bending forward or carrying heavy things, like those sort of things. So I'd go through my Socrates and then maybe add a few things which uh, makes me uh, uh, try to rule out some of my differentials. Yeah. Yes, correct, correct. So we uh, follow up with Socrates and then move next page. So now I'm going to proceed with SOB first. Okay, for this case, uh, the SOB is gradually started one month ago and we're sending for the past two weeks. That patient claimed that she cannot walk for more than 100 meters and need to stop to catch her breath, which uh, fall under MRC grade 3. And the SOB worsened when lying flat on bed, relieved by sitting upright. And patient denied taking any inhaler. This SOB associated with cough, chest tightness and also pain, intermittent low-grade fever, anemic symptoms such as palpitation, lethargy and dizziness. She also complained of um, loss of weight, which is 7 kilograms within 6 months but there was no loss of appetite and night sweat. She also did not any wheezing, during ovarian, hoarseness of voice, sweating, PND, autopnea, leg swelling, anosmia, recent contact with TB and COVID patient. And she also did not uh, preceding trauma and also feeling of anxiousness, which these questions are asked because of because we want to rule out the differential diagnosis. Okay, can we move to next, uh, Chief Humping? Okay, for chest pain, uh, this patient said that the chest pain is centrally located, centrally, and it started one month ago together with SOB. It is sharp in nature, but there is no radiation. And things that trigger the chest pain is coughing, and the cough is uh, productive, which is whitish phlegm with the amount of half a cup, but there is no blood stain. And also there is no uh, pink frothy um, production. And the pain score is 3 over 10. Patient also denied any acid brush, burning sensation, and proceeding trauma to the chest. Okay, and associated symptom, patient have, like I mentioned just now, SOB, cough, palpitation, dizziness, lethargy, and loss of weight. And to complete the HOPI, we need to ask about systemic review, which might relate to the case. For example, uh, patient doesn't have any abdominal distension, abdominal pain, jaundice, pruritus, and easy bruising, change in urine volume, color, and characteristic, Alter bowel habit with normal amount of color, uh, with normal amount and the color of the stool. Patient also denied headache and leg pain, and also no periorbital edema, nausea and vomiting. Okay, um, uh, Musa, can you please back to the previous page? Okay, uh, anyone can try to answer me. Why why do I mention here about PND, dysmia, autopnea, and leg swelling? Sorry, uh, PND, autopnea, leg swelling. Anyone? Chia Seng? Because it points to heart failure. Yeah, we can suspect that. And also, um, the recent TB contact, COVID contact, and anosmia, because we want to rule out the current pandemic, and also the most common uh, infectious disease in our country, which is TB. And yes, we need to ask about preceding trauma also, because uh, it, might, it might lead to pneumothorax. We are not sure, right? For mystery. And also... Um, I asked about feeling of anxiousness because anxiety also can lead to SOB. However, uh, very rarely it lead to cough and uh, very rarely it lead to cough. So just to rule out. Okay, next. For the systemic review, uh, for the first point, um, since patient have SOB, so we might I I might suspect the pleural effusion. So I asked about any sign of liver failure and the second point of renal failure. And for headache and leg pain is for uh, polycythemia and also blurriness of vision. You can ask about that. Okay. Um, 
I think I will finish all the history first and then I will allow doctor to comment everything. <laughs> okay, both. Okay, uh, guys, do we miss any important point in the HOPI, especially the chest pain one? Mirza, uh, previous page. Okay, um, Sherwin, can you try to answer? Is there any missing point in the chest pain? Um, so I'm actually wondering whether there's any like pain on inhalation. Uh, inhalation? Mm. Oh. Okay, okay, yeah, we can ask about that. Usually pleuritic chest pain, if I'm not mistaken, it happened with inhalation, right, Mirza? Yeah. Okay, so also there is pain on inhalation. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, um, Gojit, you want to try? Is there any missing point in the chest pain history? Yeah, hi. Uh, maybe I would like to know whether the pain is it first time having this chest pain or previously does it have seen kind of episode before? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah, correct. And then we also oh. can ask about, um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, also I have to ask if the pain is on and off or is it a persistent pain and also the progression of the pain, is it worsening or is it constant? Yes, correct. And so we need to ask whether it's sudden or slowly happen, right? Yeah, correct. Those that dimension just now is the one that we missed. Okay, next page. Okay, next. Okay, so after we finish the Hodge OPI, proceed with plasma case 3. She was diagnosed with stage 4 lung adenocarcinoma in December 2020 when she presented to the clinic with unresolved chronic cough. She is currently on her ninth cycle of chemotherapy. And from that chemo, she only experienced alopecia with un no other um, side effect. And she didn't have any uh, other medical illness. Also, the underlying one, no history of asthma and COPD. For past, past surgical history, she undergone C-section and, and that's it. She didn't take any medication or traditional medication or any supplement, and there's no known allergy to food or medication. For family history, there's no significant family history. Uh, she didn't have any family history or malignancy. And for past social history, patient uh, do not smoke. Uh, she also um, do not drink alcohol or take any illicit drug, but she is a secondhand smoker from her husband and friends. And I think uh, if we are the one who take history from this patient, I think it's important for us to ask whether the has since when the husband smoked, since when she get the exposure, and she works in private sector, which I think we need to ask more what kind of work did she do, because it might be related to occupation. Maybe she just changed her work, right? I'm not sure whether after this uh, we can ask the doctor to correct me. And she is married with one children, with one child, and live with her family. She is an active mountain climber uh, when climbing twice in one month. Um, and there is no traveling history. Okay, um, that sum up the um, history from this patient. Dr. Tan, do you have anything um, to correct me or to add? Uh, Mirza, can we go back to the uh, this slide? Thank you. Um, actually, if you're thinking of a patient of a lung cancer, um, we don't usually use MRMRC la, in this case. <laughs> So uh, MRRC usually relate to some chronic respiratory disease, like things like asthma, COPD, or maybe lung fibrosis, you still can use. Uh, if we're thinking about cancers wise, um, we tend to uh, use another score, what we call uh, ECOG performance status, ECOG score. Okay, so uh, it's, I'm not sure whether, some, maybe some of you have heard about this ECOG score before. Uh, it's almost, um, it's a bit different from your MRRC, Basically, it quantifies uh, how breathless a patient in relation to activities. So the highest is four. Uh, four means uh, it can that we can accept uh, there, There's something called five as well, uh, but five is uh, it's not so important for us. Five means it got five means patient already died, uh, so we don't use five. <laughs> so uh, we use up to four. Four uh, basically patient are actually uh, breathless at rest. Uh, ECOX 3, basically patients spend 70% uh, of the time actually on the bed. So meaning uh, on the beds, meaning they are actually breathless uh, and they need to be, to be on the bed 70% of the time. Uh, ECOX 2 uh, basically means 
seventy uh, percent of the time they are actually mobile. So it's the opposite of three. Okay, three is actually on the beds. Two is actually seventy percent of them mobile. Okay, uh, ecox one. Uh, they are breathless on uh heavy exertion. Okay, on when they are actually um doing a strenuous activity, they are breathless. Okay, uh, ecox zero means they are normal people. Normal as, uh, normal, normal as and others. So in this case, um, I would say, you know, let's say based on the histories, uh, it probably ECOX um, one or two, but depends on uh, whether how, how, how much time they spend actually on the, on, on the bed or on the chair or on the activities. Okay, uh, I think in the chat group just now, there's someone asked about uh, the symptoms of uh, dyspnea that worsen on lying flats and a relief, relief on sitting upright. Uh, is it optopnea or not? <laughs> Do you think is it optopnea? Mm, I, I don't think so. Why? What, so what is optopnea? Well, based on what you understand, what do you, what do you, what do you understand about optopnea? Okay, uh, autopnea is when a patient experience SOB when lying totally flat. Mm -hmm. uh, she made it multiple number of pillows. Mm -hmm. to, mm. Yeah, so wouldn't it fit the description? Yeah. Like what you, what you written there? <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so you, you can call this autopnea, la, sort of. La, huh? Because we do have some patient that is uh, so severely breathless on lying down, even with a uh, few pillows that are almost like sitting upright positions. I had patients that actually they don't use pillows. They even they just sleep on the chair that uh, the you know the lazy chair they can adjust the height. <laughs> I just sleep on those kind of chair. <laughs> so it's so bad. <laughs> so we still call that as autopnea <laughs> anyway. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. so doctor, autopnea doesn't necessarily happen in uh coron upper heart failure only, right? Uh, autopnea is just a symptoms lah. So it's meaning okay. if you have autopnea doesn't really mean that this patient had uh to be had must be heart failures okay. okay. So uh so if in this case uh, what else can cause this kind of symptoms? Uh I think uh, later on in the in the physical examination you will show us why. Then we can and then you can explore further from there. Uh I'll explain further from there. Um I think the rest is quite straightforward. Uh, Mirza can go to next slide. Um, chest pain wise, I think these are very standard questions. Uh, right, I have nothing to comment here. Okay, next. Mm, okay, I mean, yeah. Okay, now next. Okay, so. Ah, yes. Uh, here, here is actually regarding to on her, her treatment for lung cancers. Okay. Um, so. Uh, if a patient on chemotherapy uh, and having lung cancer um, and thinking back the symptoms of uh, cough, shortness of breath and chest pains, so what are the things that come to your mind? What can happen? Um. Ah, yes. Yeah, just progress rapidly. Um, usually, if you're on treatment, you shouldn't be progressing rapidly, la. So, uh, not this, this. Um, I'm trying to test your. Um, what what do you think the complication that can happen on if the patients on chemotherapy? Is it um hemolysis syndrome? Ah uh, no, uh, not so much in lung cancer. <laughs> Hematology cancer, okay. yes, la, but not in in lung cancer, la. Uh, someone said, uh, malignant perifusion. Um, malignant perifusion is more towards the disease itself, not so much of the therapy. Uh, if a patient on chemotherapy and uh, cerebral lung cancers, um, the thing I'm looking for is actually the risk of infection. Because chemotherapy suppresses, most chemotherapy suppresses your immune systems, so you tend to get um, bone marrow suppression, you, the risk of getting infection is higher. And uh, most of the patients that immunocompromise, uh, they may not get fever because they cannot mount the immune response, but they still get the other symptoms, short of breath, cough, prudence, symptoms, things like that. Okay, so um, 
yes, you can get febrile neutropenia if you mount a fever. Uh, then that will uh, febrile neutropenia most of the time you get fever and uh, you get uh, low total white count. Uh, other things that can relate patient on chemotherapy, lung cancers, uh, pulmonary embolisms. Okay, so the uh, looking at the the uh, the charcoal the charcoal triads, hyperviscosity is there. Uh, when patient on chemotherapy, of course the uh, the risk of uh, embolism is higher as well. Okay, so um, these are when patient with pulmonary embolism, of course you get pleuritic, you can get chest pains, you can get um, short of breath. Um, right. Okay, can you go next? Okay, so I think uh yeah. Um yeah, so this patient do not smoke and uh, was mentioned to as uh, second hand smokes. Um so how do you quantify uh the amount of cigarette smokes that uh, that this patient is exposed to? So I think you mentioned this now is uh from see how, how many pack years the husband's smokes actually. So uh, then the question now is actually uh, which one you should take, the house or the work? <laughs> so then depends on how much time they spend on each of those places. Okay, let's say they spend most of the time at home with the, hus uh, with the husband and thing, of course you take the pack years from the husband. Uh, but um, colleagues or friends, that's a bit difficult. Uh, I, I don't think anybody will know uh, how much your friends smoke or how long they have smoked. <laughs> okay. So but what you can do is actually how long the patient actually have worked in that place. Okay, let's say um, I used to have a teacher that uh, they work in the staff room. I mean, the teachers, they, uh, previously the, teacher, the, the other teachers smoke in the staff rooms. So they have been smoking second smokes for the last 15 years. Okay, so that is, so that is related to the occupational history that you need to explore a bit more. Okay, next. Okay, the physical examination. Okay, uh, thank you, Doctor. So we we'll proceed with physical examination for this patient from general inspection. Uh, Madam M is alert, conscious, and not under respiratory distress. There is a chest tube seen on her left lower lateral chest wall, which is connected to a drainage bag containing 100 cc of fluid. The tube is filled with fresh blood. And there's also a sputum cup at the bedside with it being half full with whitey sputum. No streak of blood or pink bubble seen. Okay, that's general inspection. And for peripheral examination, before we proceed with the um, chest examination, uh, it's basically normal with a pulse rate of 79 beat per minute with good volume and regular rhythm. Respiratory rate was 19 breath per minute. Others findings are negative. Okay, next. For respiratory examination, Upon inspection, uh, other than the chest tube, there were no scars, skin color changes, or chest deformity seen. And upon palpation, there is no tracheal deviation and tracheal tap. Apex bit was not displaced. The chest expansion was reduced on the left side. Upon percussion, there is tony dullness over the left middle and lower zone. And auscultation, there is reduced pressure on the left mid lower zone and reduced vocal parameters over the left mid lower zone. To complete this uh, examination, we, we, we will check for cervical lymphadenopathy, bipedal edema and sacral edema, which all are negative. Okay, next. Okay, uh, wait. Yeah, okay. Uh, should I comment or should I, you want to yeah, ask? Yeah, your... you can proceed. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, Okay, so um, okay, first thing, do you think it's blood inside the tubes? Is it fresh blood? Um, yeah. So uh, okay, so how how do you know whether it's blood or not? We need to look at the color. Um, color will, will not tell you whether this is blood or not. <laughs> Uh, 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 malignant peer revision also is a red color, looks like blood. Doctor, is it the consistency within blood clot uh, and uh, hemosphere's fluid? Consistency, you cannot feel it though. 
<laughs> you can already see. <laughs> okay, so um, this is a common question that we used to ask. Because um, how do you know this is not blurred? Because if let's say this is blurred, it should be clot. It should it should be form a clot very soon. So the whole tube will be blocked. Whereas in the malignant peer revisions, uh, it's because in the, the fusion loop rate because it's con all contains all these cancer cells inside. So and uh, and the red color appearance is not because of blood; it's rather because of the cancer cells. So that's why uh, malignant peer revision is never never going to form form any clot, despite its whole back is red color. <laughs> okay, so um. I will not put that as fresh blood. Lah. <laughs> so okay, you can, so it, you, you can you just put that as, mention red color. No, you can just put that hemocerous effusion. Lah. Hemocerous, okay. Yeah, it's hemocerous appearance. Lah, huh? So, uh, or you can see it red color, uh, pure fluid. Lah. Okay, but uh, the more better terms is actually hemocerous effusion. Lah. Um, uh, another comment is actually respiratory rates. Um, uh, 19 is rather a hot number. <laughs> I, don't know, I mean, uh, it, it's good that uh, you, if you count one minute for 19 uh, or like pulse rate one minute for 79. <laughs> so, uh, but in, in, in real life or in uh, real exam situations, uh, most of the time we take 30 seconds or even for a pulse rate, 15 seconds in time. Uh, so you never get uh, like 79 or 19 and things like that. And uh, actually all these are very dynamic numbers. Uh. So uh, of course the examiner wouldn't fault you. If, let's say their, their exam sheet is 88, then you get 80. Uh. <laughs> so it's still within the normal. So uh, the point here is actually, uh, all these are estimate numbers. Uh. Uh, as long as you think this is normal respiratory rate, you give any numbers also it's okay. <laughs> Okay, so it's just it's not that you must get nineteen means nineteen <laughs> in the exam same as like the exam sheet. <laughs> okay, so no because it's uh, something very dynamic. <laughs> so uh, but as but make sure in the exam you give some reasonable numbers uh, <laughs> uh, not like seventy seven, seventy nine. That wish that you 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 won't be in, impossible to get in fifteen seconds or thirty seconds. <laughs> uh, things like that uh. Just some some uh, some tips uh. <laughs> Okay, uh, for me I think. You know, exam time is short. You tend to take thirty second or fifteen second in times times four times two. Uh, then then you know roughly that what is what kind of rate the patient had. Just mention the number that is good enough. <laughs> uh, but mention the reasonable numbers. <laughs> All right. Uh, another thing is that I realize students like to mention is uh, central cyanosis. <laughs> Uh, do you do you find central cyanosis in the uh, respiratory system? Res Any respiratory disease can give you central cyanosis? As far as I know, I don't think so, lah. <laughs> uh, most of the time, when you talk about central cyanosis, you relate to some congenital heart disease, some uh, uh, some some form of uh, heart problems, uh. Uh, most of, mostly congenital heart disease. Uh, if a respiratory system examination you found a patient with central cyanosis means the patient already dead already. <laughs> Meaning it's uh, already severely hypoxic, it's uh, died already. <laughs> okay, so um, usually we, we don't find so much of a central cyanosis uh, in we don't I usually tend not to mention central cyanosis in the res, respiratory examination. <laughs> Peripheral cyanosis is still fine, but not central cyanosis. <laughs> Uh, okay, can we go for the next one? Uh, excuse me, doctor. Yeah. Can the fluid from the malignant tumor be other color other than hemocerous? Uh, it can be serous color, of course. Oh, okay. uh, so, but uh, most of the time, like, I would say 90% of the time is uh, hemocerous. Uh. So, most of the time, if let's say we drain a we drain the effusion, we saw some uh, hemocerous appearance, and we need to seriously think whether there's uh, any underlying malignancy. Doctor, can I ask a question? Um, because during my uh, exam, there was a lot of pleural effusion cases, and then when you do the, let's say you get a short case for pleural effusion, we should comment on like the character of the fluid and also what it's connected to. Uh, is there anything else that we should comment on? Like 
uh, of course it'd be connected on the lower part of the chest wall usually. Uh, uh, that's not what we are looking for. Mm. It's connected to what device? Uh, yeah, the uh, in terms of the bottle or the uh, training. Uh, what is the thing. bottle? <laughs> Uh, it's, so that bottle is that bottle is what we call underwater seal. Ah, uh, no, <laughs> yeah. It's, so and uh, sometimes we don't put underwater seals. We put into a um C, is in a CPD, CBD bags. Okay. So uh, the difference is that underwater seals um, it's good for pneumothorax, uh, especially those with hydro pneumothorax. Uh, um. If just simple plain diffusions, there's with no pneumothorax, sometimes uh, CBD back to do. Okay, so the difference between these two is actually in underwater seals, you drain the air and drain the diffusion. So when the air comes out, you will actually uh, go under the water and pin, go out to the atmosphere and will, will not go back into the tubes. So whereas in the back, if you if you had a hydro pneumothorax and you do the, do, don't put under the water underwater seals, you put in connected to the back, then the back will balloon up like a balloon. <laughs> because the air is like free flowing, you connect. So you're creating a uh, free flow. So uh, you need the underwater seal to uh, get the air to go one direction, one way. Okay, you go underwater and then just drain up to the atmosphere. Doctor, does the amount tell you anything from a short case? Because no. like, it'll particularly get changed. Yeah, mom also important lah. As you can, as I, as you as you mentioned lah, it's very dynamic lah. I can just clamp the tube, then there's nothing in the bag. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. So we can. Uh. Yeah. Doctor, do you have any comment for this uh, chest examination? Uh. Do you do you get vocal parameters on auscultation? Uh, yeah, do I? What is the more yeah cop? Is a, what is a supposed term in this case? Oh, vocal resonance. Yeah, it's vocal resonance. Huh? So you only get yeah, vocal sorry. vocal parameters in the palpation. Actually, it's actually a, a palpation examination. So you don't get uh vocal parameters in auscultations. So it's more like vocal resonance. Okay, so when you auscultate. Um, yep, I think the rest is quite okay. Okay, so uh, we're going to proceed with the diagnosis. Provisional diagnosis for this case is left pleural effusion, secondary to lung cancer, or we call it as malignant pleural effusion. The differential diagnosis are pneumonia with paranemonia effusion, empyema thoracosis, chylothorax, pleural TB, lung collapse, and progression of lung cancer uh, due to huge lung mass. Oh, sorry, some typo here. Empyema thoracis. Let's control with the CO. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Doctor, is there any comment for this slide? Um, I think um, I think uh, a lot of students struggle to give a uh, differential diagnosis when it comes to pure effusion. <laughs> Especially, we know this is a cancer type of pure effusion. It's the only diagnosis come out is always the malignant pure effusion. So, of course, there are many, many etiology behind the effusion. Uh, particularly in this case, uh, you know the patient on chemotherapy, then the risk of infection is high. So, it's, it, won't, it's, uh, it can be beside malignant pure effusion, there can be uh, pneumonia with uh, paranemonic effusion. Uh, Empyema thoracis is also infection in the lung, that's infection in the pleural actually. Uh, the difference between paranemonic effusion and empyema thoracis is that uh, empyema thoracis, there is a culture, positive culture, uh, but positive culture to say that it's a organism inside. Whereas paranemonic effusion means it's uh, they are uh, the exudative effusion, but the culture was actually negative. There's no, they didn't grow any uh, organisms. Okay. Uh, chylothorax. Uh, what do you? Why do you think I put a chylothorax there? You know what's chylothorax? 
ya um lymphatic lymphatic accumulation in the pleural space uh-huh why <laughs> <laughs> so for so for it, this case, patient might have lung cancer, which um mm -hmm. can what we call that localized to the lymph node. Uh? Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so that causes uh chylothorax. <laughs> so basically, how how do chylothorax looks like? Have you all seen the chylothorax? No. No. So what 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 do you think the lymphatic fluid looks like? Whitish in color? Yeah, it's actually whitish milky color, huh? So sometimes you might confuse it as a lung abscess, as an abscess also. So let's say a case of a case of amphimotorosis uh, and it, it can be draining abscess also. Okay, so uh then that would how to differentiate it then is actually by looking at the pure fluid analysis later. Uh, but chylothorax basically meaning it happens most of the time because of obstruction of the thoracic duct. If a that got obstructed, then you get the you can then you uh, leak into the uh, pleural space. Then you get chylothorax. Uh, the commonest malignancy that associated with chylothorax, do you know which malignancy? GI. Oh, no, it's actually lymphoma. <laughs> and lymphoma is the commonest cause of uh, chylothorax. But of course, any malignancy that can obstruct the thoracic duct can cause chylothorax. Okay, so uh, TB, TB is another infection because you're in the immuno, immuno, immunocompromised, immunosuppressed by chemotherapy, you also tend to get TB as well as one of the uh, opportunistic infections. Uh, the one that can relate to this case would be just uh, pure TB, so meaning TB in the pure space, you get effusion as well. Uh, other differentials, which is a bit less likely because uh, the physical findings more point towards the Stony downness of effusion. Uh, but if let's say without stony downness, just reduce uh, breath sound or reduce uh, the uh, vocal resonance, then they just could be your uh, lung mass or even a collapsed lung. Means uh, why collapsed lung? Sometimes cancers, uh, they can compress on the airways causing the lung collapse actually. Okay. Or whether the the tumors actually invaded into the endobron in, into the bronchus causing causes uh, obstruct, uh, obstruction in the in the airways leading to lung collapse as well. Okay, of course, cases of lung collapse you get uh, tracheal deviation and such and so and so lah. Okay, same same goes to the huge lung mass. Okay, uh, but lung cancer wise, adenocarcinoma most of the time they do not actually uh causes uh they do not usually grow very big lah. I would say. <laughs> Yeah, anything you want to ask? I yes. I think these are the few uh, uh, you can come up for the case. Like. Yes. Come on, this. Um sorry, Doctor. Uh, usually for pleural effusion for vocal resonance, usually reduce, right? Yeah. But isn't for the lung cancer it's usually increase in the vocal resonance? Can it you be mean both the lung mass, during... it? Yeah, lung mass. Yeah, lung mass can be increased. Yeah. So can we actually find both in physical examination or one only? Uh, depends. Um, if let's say patient have lung cancers together with a huge mass with uh, effusion, of course you can get uh, mixed uh, pictures. Uh, we tend okay. to see huge huge lung mass uh, with effusion in uh, in one of the thoracic malignancy, um, especially affecting the young age. Uh, what is what that's what we call germ, germ cell tumor. Uh, young patients uh, uh, in the uh, early 20s or even teenage age come with a huge thoracic mass, mass uh, with effusion. When we, uh, we can, the mass can be so big that occupy the whole hemithorax. Uh, that is how germ cell tumor tend to present. So those uh, usually affect the very young people in contrast to the usual lung CA tend to affect the uh, middle age or elderly. Um, do we see germ cell tumor? Yes, we do see some of this germ cell tumor on, on and off. Okay, thank you, Dr.
Okay, so now we move to investigation for this case. Okay, um, these are the investigation that we would like to perform for this patient. FBC, RFP, LFP, and plural fluid analysis and cytology, culture and sensitivity, and also use the plural fluid for F AFB and for to test for adenosine DNA minis. And we also will do ABG, serum protein and LDH, core profile, sputum and blood culture and sensitivity, and fasting lipid profile. And then for imaging, uh, we will proceed with chest X-ray, CT thorax, chest ultrasound, refined geogram, thoracoscopy and pleural biopsy, Abrams needle pleural biopsy, and bronchoscopy. And then final one, we can proceed with the molecular testing, which is the NGS and liquid biopsy. I think uh, Dr. Um, would like to explain more about the difficult term here. <laughs> yeah, so can Dr. can proceed. <laughs> so, Omiza, we want to try before I, before I explain. Okay, maybe uh, I can try. So usually for pleural fluid, I think the most popular thing I always get asked is like life's criteria. So uh, a few things in the labs here we can see pleural fluid analysis. So uh, for those not familiar with life's criteria, uh, from the pleural, uh, pleural effusion, we want to differentiate whether it's transudative or exudative uh, in nature. So uh, based on life's criteria, there's three components. So we can do the uh, pleural uh, serum, serum, serum pleural. Uh, uh, plural serum, I think it's plural serum uh, LDH ratio, plural serum, uh, uh, plural serum protein ratio, and then also the uh, LDH of the plura, and then uh, whether it's more than 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and two thirds of upper reference limit, then we can differentiate whether it's upper limit or uh, uh, sorry if it's transitive or exudative in nature. In a lung malignancy, we would expect it to be exudative in nature. Uh, other things here, pleural fluid culture and sensitivity to rule out the paranormal effusion and also uh, like doctors, I mean, uh, the empyema, empyema thoracosis, uh, where there would be positive culture, uh, pleural fluid for AFB for your uh, pleural TB. Adenosine deaminase, I think, is also related to uh, whether you want to differentiate whether it's transitative or exudative. I don't think it's in light criteria, but it's also another thing that can help you differentiate those. Uh, ABG, of course, in a patient, a respiratory patient, something you want to do. So serum protein and LDH is something you, because when you order, you'd order for pleural fluid studies, but to use lights criteria, you need the serum protein and LDH, like I mentioned earlier. So you need to, I guess you need to order it separately. Uh, coagulation profile uh, as a contraindication, I think, as one of your contraindications for pleural fluid uh, studies would be if the patient has any uh, coagulation disorder, if I'm not mistaken. Or I think that's for lumbar puncture. Uh, sorry, uh, sputum and blood culture for sensitivity as the patient presents with uh, cough. Uh, fasting lipid profile. I'm not sure about this, but I think it's related to the chylothorax. Uh, yeah. So uh, in terms of imaging, the chest X-ray, if it's a pleural effusion, of course we can see the blunting of the costophrenic angle, and uh, the CT thorax, chest ultrasound, which I will have a look at later, also can help you tell if it's a pleural effusion. Lymphangiogram, I think, is related to the chylothorax. Uh, thoracoscopy and pleural biopsy, I think, is related to the cancer. I'm not sure about Abrams needle pleural biopsy. Uh, bronchoscopy, uh, I guess, if it's related to a central invasion of a tumor. NGS, I'm not sure what NGS is uh, or liquid biopsy, and I. I'm not sure why we are doing molecular testing unless it's related to the adenocarcinoma in terms of the treatment. Uh, so yeah, doctor, I think. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mirza. Okay, um, okay, this. Uh, I think you mentioned a, a few of the points, but I think this need to correct you. The purity for adenosine and deaminase is one of the investigation for TB, pure TB. So we tend to be raised in the TB in cases of uh, pure TB. Uh, why you can't rely on AFB on the pure fluid because the AFB smear in the pure fluid is I can, I can tell you 100% it will be negative. <laughs> uh, somehow you don't find the uh, you don't get AFB to grow on the pure fluid. <laughs> so in order for them to grow in the pure fluid, meaning uh, is really heavily uh, heavy growth <laughs> in in the pure space. So the AFB smear. For pure fluid, uh, in every, almost uh, uh, hundred percent of it, I would say it come back negative. So how to diagnose pure TB uh, is actually you can rely on this test called adenosine deaminase. You can send a pure fluid for that. That would uh, in a race of this, then you can 
it may suggest that this may be having a pure TB. Uh, lipid profile is, is for your chylothorax. If you think that this fish is having chylothorax, you need uh, to look at the, pu the uh, pure fluid, high glyceride and cholesterol level. <laughs> Okay. Because you, your lymphatic main components is uh, your cholesterol levels and your triglycerides. So imagine your your lymph your lymphatic uh, is built into your pure space. So whatever you're draining is actually from your torrents, uh, your lymphatic drainage. So what is in your lymph your lymphatic drainage is basically your cholesterol and triglycerides. So by doing a fasting lipid profile compared to the in the serum, they will tell you whether uh, these are chylothorax or not. <laughs> okay. Uh, for appearance of chylothorax, it, as I told you, the appearance is almost similar to your abscess. It's very milky uh, materials, uh, cloudy. So uh, imaging wise, um, standard chest X-ray is very important. CT scan for further evaluation, particularly for those cases that you want to go for surgery. Ultrasound is very simple and very easy, and it also can tell you a lot of things, particularly uh, they can tell you about um, how complicated its effusion is. Yeah, by looking at the uh, ultrasound, I think your friend will tell you, you show you the images later. Lymphangiogram uh, is more towards for your, if you suspect chylothorax, okay, so because you want to find out where the obstruction is. So your lymphangiogram, you can actually uh, tell you where is the obstruction and where is the spillage coming from. Thoracoscopy and pure biopsy is for malignancy. If it's in the case of malignant pure effusion, of course, sometimes you want a tissue biopsy. Let's say in the case of a, uh, let's say we don't know this patient having uh, lung cancer yet, but from the pure fluid, it uh, looks like malignant pure effusion. Of course, you want to get a tissue diagnosis. So you do a thoracoscopy, you do a scope, at, uh, put in a scope in the pure space, and try to biopsy the pure to get a diagnosis of adenocarcinoma. Okay, Abram Nihal, Pure biopsy is a very old method of biopsy. Uh, thoracoscopy guided is basically you put a scope in. Abram Nihal means you do the pure biopsy blindly. Okay, just like bedside procedure, you poke in a very big needle. The needle can be as big as your pen. Okay, and uh, put, put into the pure and tear part of the pure out. <laughs> so that is a very painful procedure. So last night, as a medical officers, uh, without the pure, pure scope, without thoracoscopes, we need to do a blinded pure, bedside pure biopsy. So we use a needle called Abrams needle biopsy. Okay, uh, bronchoscopy basically to look for lung collapse. If you have a prior patient with a collapsed lungs, you want to find out what is causing the collapse. You you can do a bronchoscopes. Okay. Uh, the molecular testing here basically relate to the lung cancer lah. Huh? As I put that as HPE. So because nowadays lung cancer wise, we had um, the treatment is very personalized treatments. So previously we give all our cancer patients chemotherapy, but nowadays uh, there are some targeted therapies. So how to know whether they are target they are targetable mutation oncogenes? We do a molecular testing. So the the more advanced molecular testing that we can do nowadays is something what we call NGS. NGS basically means next generation sequencing. Basically, it's a genomic sequencing of the of the uh, of the uh, tumor tumor cells. So, you meaning you take the the biopsy samples, you run the genomic se sequencing of the of the of the tumor cells to find what kind of mutation was found in the tumor. Then you try to give the suitable uh, targeted mutation for targeted mutation for this patient. So that will works better for the cancers. Uh, Liquid biopsy is another way to uh, to find these um, mutations. Uh, but the difference between liquid biopsy and NGS is actually liquid biopsy basically you are taking patients' peripheral blood. Just like drawing simple blood, blood tests. And you take the blood test and try to find the uh, DNA of the tumor inside the blood. Okay, because you know tumor are spread hematogenously. So meaning the cancer cell will shred some DNA material into the blood. Uh, that's how the cancer has been spread from the lung to the other parts of the body. So by taking the patient's blood, you can do uh, um, some uh, PCR tests and try to detect the tumor DNA inside the blood. From the tumor DNA, you try to find uh, any particular mutation that cause uh, oncogenes are basically uh, they can cause the cancer 
then then can uh, we can use that to guide the treatment actually. All right. Any questions? I think it's a a question. Uh, like we talked about LADS criteria to differentiate transitative and exudative. We uh, let's say we already like most of our differential diagnosis earlier is exudative in nature. So like why in this case we would still want to do transitative and exudative? It's unlikely this patient has heart failure, liver cirrhosis, or chronic renal failure. Uh, Okay, so it, every day also you need to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, that's what mm. I say. So uh, even though it looks looks very much like it, uh, so but you still need something to prove that it, it is that. Uh, mm, uh, you don't want to miss something, then uh, then you... Now sometimes uh, I can tell you, uh, we do have patients with transudated effusion that get a mixed picture on the period period analysis. So meaning uh, somehow there's a lot of red cells inside there, uh, looks like, but you, it looks like very clear cut heart failures or renal failure, nephrotic syndrome, but pure fluid show exudative pictures. It's okay, simply because uh, when you do a pure, 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 pure synthesis, you try to do a pure tapping. Uh, sometimes you may not be careful, you can puncture some of the intercostal artery or intercostal vein or something like that. Then you can actually cause this uh, iatrogenic uh, hemothorax. May, may not be a very massive hemothorax, but it just uh, spilled some bloods into the pure fluids. And but that, uh, imagine you have a transitive effusion, you spilled some, you put some, you spilled some blood inside there, you send for analysis, it will give you a mixed picture. Okay, meaning your LDH must be high, but reporting ratio is Doctor, another thing, is the ratio something we calculate automat uh, ourselves, or is it like in the system? Uh, in, in UMMC, it's automated. As long as you send in the PET sample, the, the lab can put in the results, it gives you the ratio. Uh, if in KKM hospital, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's manually. So you have to calculate yourself. I see. All right. Okay. Uh, doctor, I have two questions. Um, yeah. For cardiothorax, can we have normal triglyceride and cholesterol level? You mean the pure fluid or the 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 fast the blood sample? Pure um, uh, both. Uh, of course, in the blood sample, usually if you do you do not have a hypercholesterolemia or hypertriglyceridemia, it can be normal level. But in the pure fluid, technically, you wouldn't find you not supposed to find any cholesterol or triglyceride that triglyceride uh, there. <laughs> so if you mm -hmm. can find. Uh, pure fluid with triglyceride or cholesterol means it's elevated. Okay, okay. Um, for the Abrams needle, in what case now do we do it? Uh, in let's say your hospital doesn't have a thoracoscope or it, and there's no there's no chest physician that uh, or a specialist that can do a scope for the patient for the biopsy. Now, of course, you want to, to get a diagnosis, yeah, but. Uh, tissue samples, then you have to do a bedside blinded Abrams needle biopsy. Mm. Um, nowadays, okay. almost all, all major hospitals have it. Uh, maybe some district hospital may not have it yet, then so you need to do this. I did this before. Uh, it's um, not, not a good experience uh, for the patient. Uh. It's very, very painful, I tell you. Okay, thank you, Rata. So now uh, we're going to proceed with the result of the lab finding. So uh, this is FBC and differential count. So we can see HB is very high. HCT is um, borderline low. Yeah, and the MCH is low. Yes, and you can see platelet is uh, spikely high there. Okay, and then next. I think the HB got something. Sorry, so, HB I think is the wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I think yeah. it's supposed to be 11.2, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's slightly low lah, compared to the normal values. Yeah. Okay, for differential count, we can see uh, neutrophil is high, while others uh, differential um, cell are normal in range. But then why do we have risk in platelets here? Oh, it's because of the... Because of what? <laughs> Why do we have raised in platelet very high? Uh, I don't know, but it can it can be it can be reactive thrombocytosis. Uh, 
yeah, in certain cases, uh, sometimes uh, they can the you can get this kind of reactive thrombocytosis picture, but most of the time just transient. La. So mm. I don't think uh, um, this is high, la, but um, whether to call whether this patient has underlying uh, hemat, uh, platelet disorder like uh, essential thrombocytosis, um, usually we need a few another repeat tests and see. La. So sometimes one test may not um, be sub to tell you whether this uh, is uh, real reading or not. Let's say you get persistently elevated uh, platelet, especially more than 500 uh, up to 1000, then uh, you really need to think of uh, whether there is some platelet disorder. Okay. And then the, uh, the HB is slightly low, is it because of the chronic disease itself, which is lung cancer? What do you think, based on the results? I think it's because of the chronic, uh, the lung cancer itself. Yeah, I think the MCV is normal, but MCH is low. It's more more towards the, your, um, like it still could be uh, anemia or chronic illness. Mm -hmm. la. But of course, uh, because HP is low, we still need, uh, usually we send for uh, some anemia workout, your serum, INT, IBC, everything that will actually give us more details on whether this patient has some nutritional deficiency. Sure. Okay. Okay, next, other piece. Okay, for coagulation studies, uh, we can see the PT ratio is slightly right, rise, uh, raised, <laughs> and the, yeah, the PT ratio is slightly raised, and the platelet also raised. So, like, is it because of the reactive thrombocytosis like Dr. mentioned just now? Mm. 1.2 is still okay. La. I, I, I still not very, uh, it, I, because um, you can see INR, there's no range, right? So typically anything less than 2 is actually still acceptable. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Doctor, I have a question. Earlier I said that uh, we do the coagulation studies to look for any contraindication to the pleurosynthesis. Uh, I was basing that off like we don't do a lumbar puncture if there's coagulation disorder. Is it the same thing for uh, yeah, pleurosynthesis? I think same same thing also, like, first you want to stick a needle in, of course you want to make sure that the patient does, do not have any risk of bleeding. So in that so, case, if they have high risk of bleeding, do we have to like um, give them factors, is it? Yeah, it depends what is the problem. Let's say platelet is very low, then no point transfusing platelet. Like. But if let's say mm -hmm. the coagulopathy, there's a INR more than two, of course you might want to give some factors, uh, uh, FF, uh, fresh frozen plasma to uh, correct it, then only perform the procedures. Because if you put a needle in, uh, unfortunately you injured one of the arteries or even the even the small capillaries in the case of coagulopathy, you can cause a hemothorax. Uh, hemothorax is actually a medical emergency. So meaning uh, any patient with hemothorax, they have to go, for, regardless what are the cost, you have to go for urgent surgery. You have to, surgeon have to go in and uh, uh, like get the arteries or uh, secure the bleeding. And they end up uh, very mass, ma uh, major surgery, major procedures. Uh. So on the safe side, usually before the proceed any procedures, we we'll make sure there's no coagulopathy. All right, thanks, Doctor. Okay, thanks, Doctor. Okay, this is the chest X-ray for uh, this patient. Uh, we try to make it fast. Uh, chest, yeah, try to uh, interpret chest X-ray. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll try. Um. Um. First, I think this is the female patient, and then. Um. I think the. X-ray exposed, the airway is patent, uh, the exposure is good, uh, the X-ray is not rotated either. Um, and the costrophenic angle on, on the right side is, is normal, um, but for the left side it is not seen, so I think there's left pleural effusion. Um, also, there's uh, left homogeneous opacity over the left. Um, I think it's left lower looks. 
and maybe a bit of the left upper loops as well. Um, and I can't appreciate the left heart border and I also cannot measure the size of the heart and the heart is seen slightly displaced to the right side. And, 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 for, and also externally, there's no any bone deformity or bone fracture seen. Yeah, I think, I think that's it from me. Uh, also, I think the okay. primary, primary marking on the right side is pretty normal as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay, uh, thank you, Joshua. And uh, I think what you mentioned is uh, correct, I think. I, I want to add a few things. The trachea is slightly deviated away from the leash, side of lesion, which is to the right side. And there is a meniscus sign over the left side of the lung region. Okay, so we uh, pass to Doctor. Is there any comment for the chest X-ray? Yeah, I think I think this is a very classical X-ray uh, for, for pure effusion. You get a meniscus kind, the uh, the absence of the left uh, costophrenic angle that is not seen. Um, the mediastinum was uh, shifted slightly, been pushed to the right side. Um, tracker duration wise, um, not very obvious lah. Maybe slightly lah. Huh? A bit, bit uh, particularly the lower trachea part, lower third of the trachea. Lah. But otherwise, uh, yeah, very classical of a uh, um, pure effusion. Okay, uh, thank you, Doctor. Okay, uh, so this is the chest ultrasound, or we call as E first. Uh, maybe Doctor can uh, just proceed with this. <laughs> Okay, okay, you can see the dark area. Okay, so yeah, so the dark area. Uh, I think there are some questions about. Sorry. Uh, the right costal angle is seen from the X-rays now, uh, but the left one is not seen actually. <laughs> so this is a, a sign of pure fusion. Here, I would say it's not sharp, but maybe it's because of uh, partly of skill by the breast. Okay, so these are breast shadows. All right, can we go back to the ultrasounds? Okay, so um, the okay, so the the first uh, image on the right on the left is actually the you can the dark color part is actually the pure fluid pure fusion. You look actually like dark color. Oh, look at it. Um, and uh, depends how you place the probe. You can see uh, is this uh, this one is from taken from the internet. So it, it was labeled this as the lung, and the below part is diaphragm, and uh, below that is the liver. So this is the right side of the lung. Okay. Whereas the picture in the center here, you can see the liver very clearly. Okay. And uh, and some uh, fluids below that. So depends how you place the probe, then you can see uh, which part of it. And uh, the, the most right pictures here, you can see a lot of lines, uh, like small, small rooms. This is what we call a uh, complicated paranemonic effusions. These are septa, septae in the, uh, in, in the pure space. So if most of the time, if you had a paranemonic effusion, you start off with the, the picture on the left side. If you don't you leave it long enough, it, it turns into a picture on the uh, on the right side here with a lot of septa. So it's forming a lot of fibrins, a lot of rooms inside. So then the effusion is much dip, more difficult to drain uh, in the in when it forms all this uh, septa with the fibrins. I'll show the next slide. Oh, this is supposed to be a gift file, but it's not moving. That is fine. <laughs> okay. So, uh, not sure, but the, the slide cannot move, right? The pictures. Ah, never mind, it's okay. It's supposed to be a GIF file, so it's okay, never mind. Uh, but basically, this is also another image to show you there's a lot of uh, septa on the picture on the left side. Picture on the right, um, effusion. You can see some white structure like a thick like that. This is like uh, if you see in the ultrasound, this thing tend to move. So this thing usually are fibrins floating in the uh, effusion. 
So this is that, that this is what we can do from ultrasound of the thorax. Okay. Yeah, this is the plural fruit analysis result. Uh, I think Doctor, is it normal, Doctor? Except for the hemosphere's. What do you think? <laughs> I didn't give any other <laughs> Um, In my opinion, uh, the appearance is hemocerous. Uh, I guess from the pH, we can rule out thor uh, empyema thoracosis as it would be acidic, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I don't think the pleural fluid should have such high lymphocyte levels, but I'm not sure how to comment on the polymorph or the large cells. Hey, not in a... Normally, you shouldn't get any of this in a pure, pure, pure space. Lah, huh? Polymorph lymphocyte large cells shouldn't be there. Lah. So we, we managed to detect, detect all this. That means it's uh, pathological. Lah. Okay, so in a case of um, paranumeric fusion or empyema thoracis, you tend to get a lot of polymorph because it's uh, acute acute infections. Yeah, so it's the wall of a polymorph. Polymorph is your neutro neutrophils. Uh, lymphocyte. Um, okay, those um, we usually see um, those um, we see uh, lymphocyte and fusion in the case of uh, TB or malignancy. Uh, sometimes your cancer cells can mimic uh, have the same size as your lymphocyte, so your automated um, machine may count that as a lymphocyte instead of a tumor cell because they can't differentiate that. Yeah, same same go to large cells. Large cell means uh, those are bigger cells. They are not uh, the size of polymorph or lymphocyte. So if you see some large cells there, so always think of a uh, malignant. Uh, I think someone asked about uh, uh, focus and uh, EFAS. I think yeah, focus and EFAS it can be the same thing lah. So depends on uh, which terminology you use. But uh, in short, yeah, look, they're referring to the thoracic ultrasound. Okay, what do you think? Okay, so based on the protein ratio, we see this uh, at 0 0.7. Uh, LDH is 5 at 2. Uh, upper and then to the, I think this is more than uh, LDH. Oh, I need to do the ratio. Are you? Uh, 5 at 2, 6 at 2. Oh, sorry, the ratio is actually LDH ratio. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I am not sure about the upper reference limit of normal for the plural fluid, but I guess uh, all this is pointing towards a uh, 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 exudative as uh, the protein ratio is more than 0 0.5, uh, the LDH ratio is more than 0 0.6, and uh, LDH, I would assume this is more than two-thirds of the upper reference limit of normal, all uh, according to Lights criteria. It's actually exudative, like, very clear cut. Like, huh? So 0 0.7 and 1.2. Uh, what do you think of RBC and WBC? The white blood cell is uh, definitely high. Uh, I think, uh, as the doctor said, it could be because of the cancer cells mimicking the white blood cell. RBC, maybe that means that there was a, a puncture of one of the vessels contaminating the sample. Yeah, maybe the... the the procedure itself is not so um, uh, straightforward. They might injure some capillaries along the way. So you can see a lot of RBC there. So because um, when you have some RBC there, so automatically your WBC will be a bit raised actually as part of the injuries. Uh, but it's not high enough to say this is an infection. So usually if you like more than a thousand or so, then of course, uh, and the RBC is not that high, then we, you might suspect this case of an uh, infection, uh, like uh, paranormal effect, uh, effusion or even empyema. But if it's just a uh, very high RBC and uh, slightly a bit elevated uh, WBC, then could be just iatrogenic, uh, procedure related. Uh, but to say whether this is cancer cell or not, you know, usually we look at the, the differential counters now, polymorph, lymphocyte, all those. Uh, hmm. Okay. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Rita. So now, uh, uh, before we end this session, we might proceed with the management for this case. For acute management, we need to do a primary assessment with ABCD to stabilize this patient, give os oxygen supplementation, do thoracosynthesis uh, for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes, uh, give tube drainage, which I think this patient already uh, have been given, empirical antibiotic, chlorodestive is malignant efficient, Surgical decortication, chest tissue therapy, and dietitian referral is is colorized. Uh, this uh, lower four, that we explain more later. And uh, for long term, it depends on the cause itself. We need to treat the underlying cause. For for this this patient, um, if it is due to the lung cancer itself, so we might we need to focus more on the lung cancer, like Dr. mentioned just now. And we can give a uh, vaccination, like Musa mentioned previously. And also, we can do indwelling pleural catheter and pulmonary rehabilitation post surgery. So, uh, I'm giving the mic to Dr. Tan back. Yeah, okay, I think um, pre revision wise, uh, quite common case. Lah. So, have you put out for exam before? Yes. Uh, I think usually those, um, if let's say, uh, sometimes uh, for your end of postings for your final years, or sometimes uh, we do give a case of pre revision. Because uh, that is the easiest case to find in the ward. For your final MBBX exam, uh, rarely la, we put up a free refusion. Because okay, uh, these are more, more of acute problem rather than a chronic problem. La. Okay, so um, you do sometimes get free refusion for your final MBBX exam, uh, especially if let's say the supposed exam patient didn't come, so we have to get take patient from the ward. So you do see one or two of these cases, but not many. La. Okay, but the management is always, uh, I mean, patient with shortness of breath, of course, oxygen is a must. Uh, you diagnose a pure effusion, uh, usually we'll do a thoracosynthesis. Uh, you can either diagnostic, do it as a diagnostic procedure, meaning just draw a certain amount of fluids just for the testing, or you can do a therapeutic Thoracosynthesis. Therapeutic thoracosynthesis meaning you remove a significant large amount of fluid. Okay, we can actually remove up to 1.5 liters at what set, one setting. Okay, so like the effusion just now is a so huge effusion. Uh, normally there is at least few liters of a uh, pure fluid inside. So um, but why can't we remove everything? Because um, same thing if you remove more than 1.5. So there's a few things that can happen. One, you can risk of a uh, hypovolemic shock because you you also lose you lose fluids a lot too much. Then you can get you can go into shock. That's number one. Number two, uh, you remove the fluid too fast. Uh, you can get re-expansion pulmonary edema because we have the effusion. The lung is actually collapsed. Part of the lung is actually collapsed. So you remo suddenly remove all the effusion, the lung re-expands suddenly. So it was quickly filled up with all the, the uh, capillaries and bloods, then you get re-expansion pulmonary edema. So can, patient can go into uh, acute shortness of breath after that. So most of the time we tend to remove up to one liter or 1.5 liters of fluid uh, therapeutically if patient is symptomatic. Okay, so, um, of course, uh, by inserting a chest tube also is a is a better way to relieve the symptoms. Uh, you you can actually um con you actually clamp the tubes at a certain with a certain amount of fluids, then release it again and clamp it again to release some more of the fluids to drink to slowly drain all the perfusion now. Um, antibiotics wise, uh, depends what is your working diagnosis. If you're thinking it's infections, of course, uh, empirical antibiotic you should be given especially in the case uh, of you thinking it's a pyrimidine uh, pneumonia, pyrimidine effusion of uh, secondary pneumonia. Uh, pure disease, uh, do you know what's pure disease? Uh, when you fuse the uh, pleura together, so there's no cavity to form a pleural effusion. Yes, okay, so in a malignant pleural effusion, you know that effusion will be recurrent. So it will be, uh, after you remove the pleural fluid, you will re re because of the tumor cell there. Okay. So the tumor cell is irritant to the pure surface, pure membrane. So if you don't remove it, then you know that uh, when the tumor spread to the pure surface, 
is uh, is already metastatic metastatic disease. Uh, the hope to cure is actually not not there. So to prevent recurrence pure effusion, sometimes what we can do we can do a pure disease. Pure disease meaning you drain all the effusion, uh, not necessarily dry meaning drain to the minimum. Uh, that reduce the uh, space between the pure uh, the parietal visceral uh, parietal pure and the visceral pure. Then you, you put in some uh, medications to fuse the two pure surface, the visceral pure and parietal pure fused together. So there's uh, seal off the pure space so that the effusion will not be occur again. So that is what we call pure disease. Uh, how do we do it? You can put in some medications. Um, there are a few medications we can use. One is what we call uh, it's, it's some antibiotics that like what we call uh, tetracycline. Uh, we also use some chem chemotherapeutic agent like bleomycin. Um, the other thing that we can use is talc. Talc is uh, something like uh, your, your talc powder, but these are medicate, medical grade talc, TALC. These are, we put it there, uh, infused inside to induce inflammation so that uh, they cause a fibrosis between the two membranes, then subsequent to the sealing of the pure space. Uh, surgical decortication, surgical decortication only for cases of uh, emphyma thoracis. You know that it, the pure space is dirty, contaminated with all the bacterial growth. Uh, your antibiotics can remove all of it. Then you need to go in, uh, go for surgery and manually clean it. Ask the surgeon to clean the pure space. So they do a decortication. They remove all the fibrin or the, or the septa so, so that the lung can be re-expanded. Uh, physiotherapy um, is usually is uh, you know this patient is hanging hooking on the tubes, uh, it's on the beds uh, to pro to facilitate the lung to be re expanded faster. You always ask them to do some chest physiotherapy. Uh, dietitian, why is it that we need dietitian referral for chylothorax, Mirza? Uh, is it related to the lipid levels, uh, doctor? Uh, yes. Uh, I guess uh, we would try to reduce the lipid intake because uh, it will reduce the lymph accumulation. No. <laughs> Sorry, doctor, I don't know. Okay, so you are leaking cholesterol materials into your pure space and you can leak up to a few liters inside. So what happened to the body? Because yeah, cholesterol is not all bad, actually, you know. You need your cholesterol to break your cell, cell wall, actually, you know. So it's important to your for your cell function actually. So imagine if you lose all the cholesterol and triglyceride into the pure space, you are actually malnourished, you know. Okay, because you lack of all these um, cholesterol materials to build your cell wall to, for the cell function actually. Okay, so uh, that's why patient with chylothorax, you always refer to the dietitian to replace back the essential fatty acid. I don't want the cholesterol. I want the essential fatty acids for your cell wall functions. Okay, so they are uh, which uh, essential fatty free fatty acid that we are replacing. Do you know? That I cannot remember. <laughs> ah, physiology. This is your medium medium chain free fatty acid. Okay. Okay. Or uh. How do you replace it? The, usually the dietitian will prescribe something called MCT oil. It's a medium chain uh, triglyceride oil. So these are uh, supplements they add into their diets. So to increase the uh, uh, free fatty acid uh, in, intake in their diets so that they will replace it in your body so that your body will not be malnourished because of the loss in the, the, the pure space. Yeah, but whatever loss in the pure space cannot be used in the body. <laughs> so everything in, in our thoracic duct, uh, in, inside your lymphatic system, that only can be used. Okay. Uh, Long-term treatments depend on the cause. Of course, if you infection, you treat the infection, it will be better. If you, let's say it's cancers, then you treat the cancers appropriately. Vaccination is a must. I think we mentioned, discussed that before in the previous case. Uh, what is indwelling pure catheter? Not sure, doctor. Okay, so um, as I said, 
um, for operation with malignant pre-revision, of course, the best way to seal off the pure space by doing a pure disease. But in certain instances, the pure space just uh, become taken and they cannot approximate. Because in order to stick two, two things together, you need, uh, you need the space to be small. Then you put the medicine in and you stick. Imagine, let's say the pure space is pure, the pure surface is very thick, but after you drain the pure fluid, you still leave a space there. Then the space, wherever you put in, also you cannot stick because it's too too far away. So what to do? There will be a space there. The space will always fill up with fluid, and the fluid become a lot, patient becomes symptomatic. So what we can do is actually we can put in an indwelling pure catheter, meaning it's a permanent pure catheter that we put into this space so that uh, a uh, patient will connect to a drain. So what, what uh, the good thing about this indwelling pure catheter is patient can bring this catheter back home and uh, they can manually drain it whenever they are symptomatic. Let's say they feel like a bit breathless, they open up the tap, they let, let the water flow out. <laughs> then they are okay, then they close the tap back. <laughs> so they man so it's a, uh, uh, they are they can manage at home instead of staying in hospital for all for all their life. Uh, pulmonary rehab wise, not so much for cancers, not so much for infection, but most of the time we uh, after surgery lah, major surgery. So decortication is actually a major surgery, so they need a lot of pulmonary rehabilitation or physiotherapy lah. I have a question regarding the pleural disease. We know hmm. that the pleural cavity, like physiological, it uh, provides some pressure for inhalation and exhalation. So if we do a pleural disease, will the patient have like uh, progressive uh, like uh, dyspnea or like what's the consequence from doing a pleural disease? Nothing. You say, mm. oh, yeah, the pleural space is just a potential space. Mm. So there's, uh, if you fuse it, it's, um, it's, the space is just there uh and it's actually no specific function i would say mm. so if you if let's say there is some something like cancers that causing the fusion there so the only if, if you fuse it patient will be better and it will not cause much it will not cause problems to the patients but normally if the normal people we they, they won't the space won't be seen lah because the lung is expanded <laughs> Thanks, Okay, um, I think this is the last case, right, Mirza? Yeah, so I think this is the last case. Um, before we end, is there any questions that anyone has regarding the case or anything at all you want to ask Dr. Tan? I apologize that it's 11 o'clock already and we've extended uh, a lot. But I really think I learned a lot. Uh, is there any questions before uh, we end? Um, hi, yes. Hi, Dr. D. It's Shirin here. Just wondering, the indwelling a uh, catheter, right? Is it uh, a pigtail catheter? Uh, no. Um, pigtail catheter uh, is a very small catheter. Um, it's just like uh, the pigtail is twisting around, like automatically. Those usually are temporary. Pigtail catheter are temporary catheter, so you cannot use it as a permanent catheter. So this indwelling period catheter are permanent catheter, meaning meaning patient will keep the catheter as long as their life is. So uh, it's not twisted, so it's a straight one. Uh, the deep and it's uh, bigger than your pigtail catheter. Uh, because why you need it bigger? Because a uh, small pigtail catheters can easily get blocked if, let's say, uh, you leave it long enough. I uh, see. Okay. okay. Yeah. Another good another good thing of an uh, indwelling pleural catheter is uh, sometimes. Uh, we do see some cases that uh, what we call spontaneous pure disease. Okay, uh, because you put in a catheter, pure, indwelling pure, a permanent catheter there, it also can uh, trigger some inflammatory response, irritate the pure. So when the when the when the effusion is getting less with the inflammation, you can cause uh, spontaneous pure disease. So when the pure disease happen, when the pure fluid is not draining anymore, we can remove the catheter. Okay, thank you, Doctor. But uh -huh. I also have another question, which is like very unrelated to uh -huh. these two cases. Uh -huh. Um actually uh may I know like what whether homeopathy is actually like 
has a place in treating COVID-19 because I have a close family friend who, who, who is asking me about this and I couldn't find any articles on it to actually prove that homeopathy is actually beneficial to COVID-19 patients. Uh, I, I, I have no idea about homeopathy, but so far as far I know, um, as looking at the pathophysiological process, I think uh, it's a difficult disease. Uh, I don't think any of the traditional of uh, alternative medicines uh, methods can help in treating this disease. Uh, even people was uh, a lot of people talking about ivermectin, which is the uh, supposed to be a veterinary medicines uh, instead of uh, what we use in human. Uh, but there are no evidence to use ivermectin as well in uh, as of as of, as of now lah. Uh, even now, if a patient coming in with uh, uh, COVID-19 infections, I would say most of the treatment is supportive care. <laughs> we don't have effective antiviral. Um, we can give some steroids to suppress the uh, overwhelming inflammations, but it's only at the correct timing. If you give too early, sometimes you suppress the immune systems, then you get the other way. <laughs> You give too late, it will not work. <laughs> so when is the right timing? Uh, difficult to predict. Uh, always, usually, we based on the blood results, and uh, we have to guess. This is roughly that's the best time to give. <laughs> so, uh, but treatment treatment of uh, COVID nineteen, as of now. Um, I don't think any effective medicines is available at the moment. That's what I can say. Um, we give a lot of biologics, but those are usually for cytokine storm. Uh, also to predict when do cytokine storm happen, that is a lot, a, a lot of guessing also based on the blood results and the clinical pictures. So it's not like definitely after seven days you get cytokine storm, no. <laughs> so you need to predict when it's happening. So that's the thing. I see. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor. Yeah. Have you any other questions from uh, the participants? Okay. Oh, sorry. I think there's a question in the chat from HH Tan. Mm, I think it is on yeah, the classification of pneumonia, right? So, um, uh, there are many ways to classify pneumonia, actually. So you can classify it as the community acquired pneumonia, hospital acquired pneumonia, this is one way. You can classify it as lobar pneumonia or bronchial pneumonia, this is another way. Uh, but if you uh, the lobar pneumonia or bronchial pneumonia basically is anatomical classification lah, based on anatomy. Uh, the community acquired hospital acquired is basically based on etiology. <laughs> uh, of course, you can classify it based on the pathogens like bacterial pneumonia or atypical pneumonia or viral pneumonia. This is based on etiology. Uh, and uh, you can also classify it based on severity, based on your uh, CURB 65 score, mild, moderate and severe pneumonia. Uh, which is the more significant and more which will affect the treatments, I would say um, maybe the CURB 65 classifications, mild, moderate, severe, because that will impact on the treatment. Uh, of course, etiology-wise uh, also can, uh, but that one takes a lot of guessing because you may not know which is, uh, that, which is uh, actually, uh, this is definitely bacteria, this is definitely virus, because uh, nobody will know that unless you get the cultures, which is many, many days later. So the best way to treat the pneumonia, to classify and treat the pneumonia is this based on your CURB 65. So mild, moderate and severe pneumonia. Uh, whether loba and bronchial pneumonia affect the prognosis, um, not really. Lah. <laughs> I think both are just, uh, it's just the anatomical distribution of it. Lah. All right, thanks, Doctor. And uh, HH Chan also says thank you. So, uh, are there any more questions? I think we've extended the hour, uh, the session by almost an hour and a half. I'm so sorry for that, Doctor. But I, I, I honestly think I learned a lot from this session, and I hope the others in the participant uh, in the call still uh, learn everything. So, thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us tonight and sharing with us. It was a really great session. Yeah. Okay. Get, get you all learn something.
Yeah, right. we learned a lot. Thank you, Doctor. Hey, no problem. Alright, so give up the our right. session for Thank you, so Doctor. If you'd like uh, slides for tonight, uh, please fill in the feedback form in the chat and uh, uh, you'll get the slides by email if I'm not mistaken. So thank you all for attending. For those of you who've missed the session or if you want to recommend this session to your friends, it'll be up on our YouTube channel on Medsoft. So uh, you can share it with your friends. I think the knowledge imparted here is very useful. I um, Again, thank you so much, Dr. Tan. So with that, I think we'll end tonight's session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Dr. Right. Thank you, yeah. Mirza. Bye. Bye-bye.